seed. Save your energy. We have an hour. I decided if I was going to do TV, because I was never not going to be myself. You're sitting next to one on the couch. So let's just say that. Yourself, but not too much of yourself. Now, here's Jason. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another special edition of The Jason Show. I'm Jace. No audience, no sidekick, just you and me. I'm actually really, really excited about today's show. I, um, I've been thinking about this. I've done a version of this on my radio show. My Talk 1071 in the Twin Cities. And um, I thought about it, and then we got this email. Let me read this. This, is, this came uh, from a viewer named Chris. Hi, Chris. I appreciate this. He said, uh, while, J uh, while remembering Norman Lear, Jason said that he could talk for an hour about Norman and his legacy. Sounds like a great idea. Jason's golden age of TV shows. Well, again, uh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Now, Here's the deal. I'm not going to spend an hour talking about Norman Lear, but this did kind of spin off, no pun intended, into a great idea for a show. I don't know a lot about geography. I failed PE. I didn't do well in math, but I am, uh, I am wholly educated on one thing and one thing only television, specifically 70s, 80s a television. Um, a little background, if you're new to us, if you're new to me, I watched television. My love of television came from my grandma Mazak, uh, my mom's mom. Uh, every Friday night, and we'll get to my favorite show a little bit later, I would watch Dallas with her. She really nurtured my love of TV. I didn't play sports. I didn't go outside, really. I was very pale. And, uh, but I sat uh, down on the couch with my snacks and watched oodles and oodles of television, daytime game shows, primetime soaps, and late night. And we'll uh, get to all of that. So I have a wealth of knowledge. You want me on your trivia team, believe me. So we thought it'd be fun to put this knowledge to use and to tell you some great behind the scenes stories because I feel like behind the scenes stories are some of the best. You see these shows, but what happens behind the scenes? E made an industry out of this with the E True Hollywood story. So we're going to begin with, uh, well, Norman Lear, specifically his legacy uh, with his masterpiece, All in the Family. Now, All in the Family happened at a very interesting time in television. Uh, I called a bookmark moment where television changed the moment that All in the Family debuted. Uh, in, in the 70s. Because before All in the Family, television was very sugary, very saccharine. The biggest problem a family could have was that little Jane uh, left the, uh, the front door unlocked. Uh, I know, poor little Jane. But All in the Family came in and they talked about uh, race. They talked about uh, politics. Uh, they flushed a toilet, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, they t uh, talked about uh, women's issues, uh, the difference between conservatives and liberals within one family and it was encapsulated in one of the best characters the greatest characters to ever come out of television and that is Archie Bunker played by Carol O'Connor now for you youngins out there we're gonna start with this uh, the theme is also legendary I love a good theme song and all the family is simply one of the best so here is just a snippet of the original all in the family theme Boy, the way Glenn Miller played. songs that made the hit Guys like us, we had it made. Those, Those were the days. days. And to do when you were there. <laughs> Dance for girls and men, woman. <laughs> Mister, we could use a man like Hybrid Hoover again. Now, I show that to you not only because I love a theme song and I can listen to that whole thing, but because it sets up this next little fun tidbit. As I, uh, as I mentioned, Norman Lear was the creator of uh, All in the Family. To me, it's his masterpiece. Most TV critics would agree. Norman, amongst other things, uh, uh, really uh, broke barriers in television. Uh, he pushed television to really reflect society and in a time where it needed reflection. And he didn't uh, care if he upset censors. He didn't care if he upset the network executives. He didn't uh, care if he upset sections of the audience. And that was the brilliance of Norman. So what you're getting ready to see is a spoof of the theme song that you just heard that never aired because 
because the FCC, I believe in season four, season five of All in the Family, the FCC stepped in after several complaints and said that All in the Family could no longer air at 7 p.m., that the FCC was establishing a family viewing time, and they did not consider All in the Family family viewing. So after being number one in the ratings, hugely successful in its seven o'clock time slot all in the family cbs was forced to move it and it suffered in the ratings norman lear as you can imagine was none too happy about this so they shot this with the whole cast kind of a thumb in the nose to the fcc watch this television's grown up now no one needs a marriage vow folks go to the toilet now John Boy can have VD. <laughs> Plus a quick vasectomy. <laughs> After nine, nine o'clock. <laughs> Absolutely love that. And I love that the whole cast was right behind Norman Lear. And as I mentioned, moving time slots really did affect all in the family. It really uh, never returned to its number one slot. Other than reflecting society, another great legacy of all in the family and Norman Lear was the amount of spinoffs that, that came from uh, all in the Family and Norman Lear specifically. And one of them, uh, I'll just list off just a few. We have Maud, we have The Jeffersons, we have Good Times, Gloria. Who remembers Gloria? I, I wasn't gonna mention Gloria, but that was Sally Struthers spinoff. I think she was a vet. I think she was a veterinarian. Do you remember that one, Jeff? No. Yeah, she was a vet. That didn't last long. but. All in the Family's probably most successful spinoff was Where The Jeffersons. The Jeffersons also uh, reflected uh, society in a way no other show really had it showed a highly successful years before the cosby show did it uh it showed a highly successful black family george jefferson and wheezy jefferson who were introduced on an episode of all in the family the jeffersons went on to run i believe 10 years on cbs had huge ratings and made stars out of everyone including florence florence henderson another show maude Starring the one and only B. Arthur as a relative of Edith Bunker. Uh, that, that show, again, a Norman Lear uh, societal reflecting moment, Maude showed the very, uh, was the very first person to talk about abortion on CBS in the 70s. Think about that, especially now, and I'm not going to get into it, but think about that now in, in these terms. Abortion was talked about in a sitcom. Uh, this was five years, five years earlier, it was I Dream a Genie and Bewitched. And now Maude is talking about uh, abortion. Good time. Where the Jeffersons focused on affluent and, success, and, and uh, society's idea of a successful family for, for, a, uh, for, for a black family, you had good times showing uh, the other end of the spectrum. And huge success, spawning catchphrases like dynamite with Jimmy Walker. Um, uh, huge, huge hits, all from one man, Norman Lear. The last... The last spinoff that I want to talk about with All in the Family is Archie Bunker's Place. Which is actually probably the most fascinating of all of the spinoffs because uh, at the end of this sixth or seventh season, uh, 
Gene Stapleton, who played Edith, decided that she wanted to leave the show. Well, CBS, knowing what a cash cow all in the family is, they wanted uh, to continue. Gene said no. Norman Lear uh, didn't really want to continue. But CBS begged Carol O'Connor, Archie Bunker, to continue. And he, uh, Carol said, well, if Norman says yes, I'll do it. They had to get permission from Norman Lear to do Archie Bunker's place, taking Archie out of the house, out of the family, and into a bar that he had opened. And uh, Norman gave his blessing uh, with two conditions. They would not call it all in the family, and they would not use the famous theme song that you heard a few minutes ago. That show ran on for four years. And in the second year, they killed off Spoiler alert for a 50-year-old show. They killed off Edith Bunker, played by Gene Stapleton. Uh, Carol O'Connor won an Emmy, Emmy for the episode where uh, Edith, who died off camera, uh, Archie had to come to terms uh, with Edith's deaths. So you, you look at Norman Lear in general, and you look at All in the Family, and you just realize... A, well, how transformative it was for television, and you also realize how a lot of these episodes could probably never air on network television right now. Think about that for a second. 2023, the Sammy Davis Jr. episode with All in the Family, uh, the abortion episode with Maude, probably would have a hard time getting greenlit in the era uh, that we're in. Here's the good news, though. You can relive all of these moments on various streaming sites, and there is a dynamic Norman Lear collection available on DVD, a gift set. You can find it on eBay. It's one of the things I treasure the most, featuring the pilot episodes of All in the Family, Maude, The Jeffersons, and more. So as we say goodbye to 2023 and we say goodbye to the people that we lost, uh, Norman Lear uh, is one that we have to spend an inordinate amount of time uh, on remembering because he made such a difference in television. So Norman, thank you for being part of our family. We're going to come back with this deep dive in just a little bit. You are deep dive extravaganza. You're taking a trip in my mind with all the useless knowledge that I have in there uh, that I think are interesting. Behind the scenes stories about some of your favorite television shows. And this next one is actually my favorite TV show of all time. I am talking about Dallas. Dallas ran on CBS from 1978 until 1991, a historic 13 seasons and 356 episodes. This was the show I referenced earlier. This is the show that I watched with my grandma Mazak every Friday night at 8 p.m., followed by Falcon Press. Dallas, just like Norman Lear shows, was transformative in television. Before Dallas, Peyton Place was really the only nighttime soap opera ever on uh, primetime television. And it helped to revolutionize and create the, uh, the television cliffhanger, Who Shot JR, which we'll talk about probably at a different time. I loved this show for so many reasons. I, I, I loved it uh, because of the drama. I loved it because it was connected to my grandma. Even as a kid, I understood the dynamic. It was like looking in the window of rich people and realizing, oh, they're as dysfunctional as us poor people. Um, that was really the joy of the show. It was really reflective, just like Norman Lear shows were reflective of the 70s. Dallas was really reflective of the 80s. It was the show me. Uh, it was the Reagan uh, Reagan uh, era where affluence and rich and you know Wall Street, it was all just show me and give me more. Uh, the, the era of greed. And Dallas reflected that. Other than Who Shot JR, Dallas is really known for uh, in pop culture, even if you don't know what's about Dallas, Dallas is really known for two things Who Shot JR and the It's All Been a Dream shower scene. Allow me to explain. In 1984, star Patrick Duffy, who played good guy Bobby Ewing, decided to leave the show. Very much like Shelley Long did in Cheers, Patrick thought that after seven years on a hit show, he could transition into being a movie star. <laughs> that didn't work. That didn't work at all. Uh, and Dallas had to kind of change because it was really, um, it was uh, Cain and Abel. The show was really a little Romeo and Juliet, a little Cain and Abel, the good brother, the bad brother. But you take off the good brother and the show had to change. So Dallas, as a result uh, of Bobby leaving, had to get glitzier. Star Larry Hagman was not happy about this. And the ratings, uh, the folks were not, the viewers were not happy because the ratings declined. So halfway during 
what is uh, this horrible season after Bobby? Larry Hagman said, we got to get Patrick Duffy back. Well, how can you bring him back? He's dead because he, uh, the character of Bobby, the May before, died like this. car and Victoria Principal cried. Uh, uh, Victoria Principal was Bobby's wife, well, soon to be uh, wife again, Pam, and he was killed by his sister-in-law, Nutter Butters, Catherine Wentworth. Um, so, Bobby and Pam, the night before he died, uh, made up, decided to get married again and went to bed, okay? Well, Bobby died. Uh, he flatlined. And then the next season, Bobby was dead, and it created a whole bunch of plot lines. So why was the season so bad? Why did star Larry Hagman hate it? Why did the ratings drop so, so much? Well, it was because they were chasing the now number one show, Dynasty. Back in the day, it was a challenge. It was a race between Dallas and Dynasty. What, what, what show was better? Uh, Dynasty was ABC's answer to Dallas over there on CBS. Dynasty was more brittle. Dynasty was more glitzy, more glamorous more champagne, where Dallas always had kind of a rustic uh, feel, a farm feel. It was a little rougher around the edges. It was based on a ranch with farmhands and cowboys, and, and it just have a, had a rough edge to it. And it was a huge mistake to try to make Dallas more like Dynasty. They introduced wild plots uh, with bombs and terrorists, and they went to France. No, cowboys don't go to France. Let's just say that. Again, Larry did not like this next season. He hated it, and Larry was the bigwig. So he went to CBS, and he goes, we got to get Patrick back. And CBS is like, how are you going to do this? So uh, Patrick, realizing that his movie opportunities were few and far between, took a meeting with Larry. They sat in the hot tub at Larry's house in Malibu, which I would have loved to have been there. And Patrick says, how can you bring me back? I got hit by a car, and I flatlined. Patrick Duffy's wife, the legend goes, famously said, well... This whole season is a nightmare anyway. What if it was all a dream? And Larry and Patrick's face lit up, and they brought this idea back to CBS. So the 85-86 season went on, went on. The ratings continued to decline. Larry continued to be unhappy. Patrick finally decided at the top of 86 to return. Larry goes, well, we got to figure out a way to do it. Let's do the dream idea. Because remember... The character of Pam went to bed the night before, woke up, and then dude was hit by a car. So to keep everything a secret, this is so good, to keep everything a secret, they decided to shoot a fake Irish Spring commercial with Patrick Duffy using non-Dallas crew members. They rented an entirely new studio, and they had Patrick Duffy in a shower with a crew that thought they were shooting a soap commercial, Patrick Duffy turned around, turned around and said, good morning, paused and said, and you can have a good morning if you, if you wash like the Duffy family does with Ira Spring. So in the cliffhanger of the horrible season, Bobby's wife, Pam, gets remarried. They show the wedding. Everybody knows Bobby's coming back. It's been revealed Bobby's coming back, but nobody knows how it's going to happen. The moments are ticking down. You're looking at the clock going, the, sh the episode's over in two minutes. Then they show the next morning from Pam's wedding. She wakes up. She hears the shower going. She gets up out of her, uh, well, let's look at it right now. Look, look what happened. So they, at the very last minute, 
CBS had the episode. Now, what Victoria Principal shot was her opening up the shower, and she saw a dead guy in there that was the guy she just married. But CBS, when they shipped the show to all the stations, they clipped in just the part where Patrick Duffy said good morning while shooting the Irish Spring commercial, clipping it before and freezing it before he goes, and you can have a good morning too, like Irish Spring. Brilliant. So then the summer of 86, everyone wondered, how did Bobby come back? TV Guide had a cover where Stephen King and all these horror authors uh, tried to come up with uh, uh, plot lines of how, is it an evil twin? Was he resuscitated at the last minute? Some people did think, was it all, uh, was it all a dream? So then in the fall of 1986, in front of, I believe the audience was 30 to 40 million people, the season premiere of Dallas happened and it was finally revealed what really happened. Look at this. You, oh Bobby, it was awful. When I woke up, I thought that you were dead. What? I had a nightmare, a, a terrible nightmare. I dreamed that you were here and you were leaving. And Catherine was in her car and she was waiting. And, and when we started to leave, she tried to run me down, but you pushed me out of the way. And then she hit you and she crashed into a truck and she was killed. And then we took you to the hospital and you died. Hey, Pam, I'm right here. It was and all I'm fine. a dream, which historically people have made fun of. Family guys made fun of it. Uh, movies have spoofed it. Years later, Newhart, Bob Newhart's show, spoofed it by doing their own take of It's All Been a Dream. But if you think about it, it's really kind of Shakespeare. Shakespeare used dreams as a narrative tool, and there was really no other way to believably bring that character back. He had died. What are you going to do? Uh, the, the double twin? Are you going to bring a twin back? Then it's not going to be the character of Bobby. And that's what people wanted back. They just didn't want Patrick Duffy back. They wanted the character of Bobby. Are you going to do resuscitated at the last minute? That's ridiculous. Now, some could argue the dream's more ridiculous. But the dream scenario also solved the other problem. All of the horrible plot lines from the season before that everybody hated and nobody wanted to deal with. So by wiping away everything from that last season, it solved two problems in one. Unfortunately, the audience felt betrayed. Uh, they felt like they wasted an entire year of their life watching 32 episodes. And first of all, can you believe back then networks uh, seasons were 30 to 32 episodes? So folks felt betrayed and Dallas's ratings really never recovered. They did spike for that season premiere, but no one has ever uh, given an idea that was better. And if you're looking at it through the point of view of all the actors, Dallas continued for four more years, finally wrapping up May 3rd, 1991, is one of the longest running dramas in television history. So as you look back at the crazy history of that show, it is still one of the most bizarre cliffhangers ever, ever, ever on television. And it's all because of the dream. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. A deep dive into some of your favorite television shows. Uh, this has been, uh, I could do this for hours because, again, I don't know uh, a lot about geography or geometry, but I sure can tell you about Johnny Carson, and that's where we're going to go next. Uh, in 1991, Johnny was getting a little leery about continuing his Tonight Show. He had been on the air for close to 30 years at that point, uh, and his decision to leave the show was famously sped up when he found out that Jay Leno's, who at that point was his permanent fill-in host, when he found out that Jay Leno's very um, aggressive agent was pushing behind the scenes for NBC to push Johnny out and to put Jay in. Well, as you can imagine, for the king of late night, this did not sit well with Mr. Carson. So famously, famously, without telling anybody at his network, Johnny appeared at the NBC upfronts. Now, let me explain what that is. That is when the big TV executives go in front of the big advertising executives and they go, hey, here's our new show about a donkey. Uh, and here's, uh, so your soap should uh, advertise on this show about donkeys. So Johnny rarely appeared at these things. He found it to be worthless. But he made an appearance in New York at Radio City Music Hall and in front of 
all of these advertisers and all the NBC executives decided to tell everybody at that moment he was retiring and next season would be its last, his last. As you can imagine, the PR folks at NBC, the executives at NBC laid an egg right there at, Rock, uh, at uh, Radio City Music Hall and forced NBC to quickly put a succession plan in place. But first, Johnny had to complete his 30th and final season. That whole season was filled with stars uh, from Bob Newhart to Bob Euchre saying goodbye to the king of late night. And it all led uh, to the last few episodes of the show. Johnny famously thought that it would be really funny to put on a rerun uh, uh, in a second to last episode. Thank you. I thought that was funny, too. Uh, that's what we're going to do here, by the way, for the last episode of the Jason. We're just going to put on a rerun. But uh, Johnny thought that it, was, it would be funny if he just put on a rerun for the penultimate in the final episode. As Johnny joked in his final monologue, NBC did not find that quite so funny. So he decided to do two different shows. The penultimate show would be the last performance show, he called it, where he actually had guests. And he had two of the biggest guests handpicked by Johnny, the late Robin Williams and the one and only Bette Midler. And Robin was the first guest of the night. Here's a little bit of Robin on The Tonight Show. A little something from the Elvis estate. <laughs> A little something here, it's nice. Just, uh, can I try it? Should I? Please sit on down and we'll give you a pina colonic. <laughs> there you are. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> there we can go. I, can, I, can I sit in the sun today? We're going to have, we're going to Spago. Spago. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid, I also bought you the new L.A. Medic Alert. It says, I've fallen and get the hell away from me. <laughs> The only person that could really follow Robin Williams that night was the one and only Bette Midler. Johnny had grown very fond of Bette over the years. She started appearing on The Tonight Show when she was still singing in bathhouses. Johnny loved her irreverent behavior, loved her talent, and just loved her in general. So she was handpicked to be the final guest ever on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. Now, what you're getting ready to see is an Emmy-winning appearance. Yeah. People can win Emmys for just appearing on a show. Bette Midler won an Emmy for what you're about to see. She decided to sing one of Johnny's favorite songs. It's a wartime. It's a war song. And she decided to sing it to Johnny. Uh, Johnny picked it. And for the first time ever, and I know this seems uh, like a small detail, but you'll love this. For the first time ever, the producers and directors decided to take a shot of Johnny that they had never used in 30 years of The Tonight Show. A perspective shot and a shot of Johnny actually watching the performer on the stage to his left. Again, you never saw this as a viewer for 30 years on The Tonight Show. They saved it for this very special night. So here is just a little bit of Bette Midler's Emmy award-winning final performance on The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. Let's make it one for my baby And one more for the road You may not know it But, buddy, you're a kind of poet And you've had a lot of things to say You always listen to me until it's torn away. I honestly remember, because again, I'm a nerd. I was watching that show bawling. I remember watching Bet. And if you go back and you watch it, I would encourage you to watch it. We can't show you the whole clip. We can't afford that. But if you go back and you watch that full clip, uh, Bette Midler has since, I think she told this to Oprah, as she puts a lay, Bette's from Hawaii, on Johnny, you can see Bette walking off, uh, walking off backstage and Bette loses it. She said she tried to keep her composure, but she just couldn't. The emotion of the night, the emotion of the moment hit her, and you can see her breaking down as she walked away from Johnny. Johnny's final show was just Johnny. He came out from his famous uh, multicolored curtain and sat on a bench and for the final time sat 
on his throne as the king of late night, addressing the crowd, thanking his family, and then moved on to memories and giving a rare behind the scenes look at what it took to put The Tonight Show together day in and day out. Johnny famously never allowed journalists to cover uh, The Tonight Show. He always thought the show should stand for itself. So that night, it was just Ed, Doc, and Johnny. And then at the end of the night, he returned to the bench in front of the curtain and said for the final time, good night to America. And he said if he ever found anything that he uh, would enjoy as much as The Tonight Show, he would be back. Johnny never found that project. He famously appeared on David Letterman in 1994 briefly and never was seen on television again. Johnny passed away in 2005. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Oh, welcome back. This is great. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are. This is a behind the scenes look at some of the most famous moments in television history. A few minutes ago, I talked all about the one and only Johnny Carson. I mentioned that Jay Leno was Johnny's permanent fill in. Well, before Jay Leno was the permanent fill in, the one and only Joan Rivers held that title. She shared it for a while with the one and only Gary Shandling, but when Gary Shandling got his own show, Joan became the sole fill-in host for The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, even surpassing the king in ratings sometimes. And that caught the attention of the new network, Fox, and Fox's leader at that time, Barry Diller. Barry wanted Joan Rivers to lead her own late night show on the network, even though at the time in 1986, Fox had maybe six affiliates. But Barry was bullish on Joan Rivers and bullish on the success of Fox and pursued her to host her very own show. Now remember, Joan was under contract with NBC and with Johnny Carson and was, getting, was in the middle of renegotiating when Barry Diller approached her with this deal. Well, Joan made the very calculated decision to take Barry Diller up on his offer to be in her own show, but, but according to Johnny, never told Johnny first. Joan, until the day that she literally died, disputed this. She says that she called the, the Johnny producer, Peter LaSalle, and said, I'm leaving and I want you to come with me, to which Peter Sally said no. And then the next day, Fox had a press conference with Joan and Barry Diller, and that is when Johnny found out. Right after that press conference, Joan famously called Johnny Carson, and Johnny hung up on her. She called again, Johnny hung up again, and they never spoke. After that episode, Joan was officially banned from any NBC late night show. That was until 2014 when Jimmy Fallon took over The Tonight Show and welcomed Joan back to NBC late night. Well, now Barry had Joan right where he wanted her, hosting her very own show on Fox. Before David Letterman had The Late Show, Fox had The Late Show. The Late Show with Joan Rivers. Here's a little bit of the very beginning of that show. Take a watch. Live from On that first night, Pee Wee Herman, Elton John, and Cher, and David Lee Roth. That's right. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that picture? You can find it in most places. Jones ratings, even though Fox didn't have a lot of affiliates, was very strong uh, on that first night, even the second night. But things quickly took a turn. There was backstage arguments between Joan's husband, Edgar, and Barry Diller, and things turned bad to worse when finally, after just a few months, Barry Diller told Joan her husband, who was the executive producer of the show, could no longer appear on the Fox lot. They had banned Edgar, Joan's husband, from the Fox lot. Joan didn't know what to do. She was literally caught between her job and her husband. So Barry Diller famously fired Joan and then banned her from the Fox lot. Joan, after just a few months uh, from being the queen of late night, was now unemployed. Months later, sadly, sadly, as a result of all the turmoil, uh, Joan Rivers' husband, Edgar, took his life. Uh, and it was just unbelievable. It was later, many years later, documented in a TV movie starring Joan and her real-life daughter, Melissa. 
Joan eventually did rebound. She became the center square on a syndicated version of Hollywood Squares. And in the early 90s, Joan got her own daytime show. show the Joan River Show. She ended up winning a daytime Emmy, and in her acceptance speech, she cried, talking about how the business had forgotten her. She was blackballed from every single place, including NBC. But this, this was proof that you can make a comeback no matter how bad things are. Joan continued to re, uh, re kind of continued to evolve and reinvent herself right up until the time she died. I love you, Joan. We're going to take a break. More behind the scenes stories on this special edition of our show right after this. Scenes extravaganza. Oh, I saved one of the best to last. This is another thing that I could talk about until the cows turn green. And that is the series finale of Newhart. Bob Newhart's second sitcom on CBS, the first being the legendary Bob Newhart show. Newhart, for all you youngins, uh, Newhart took place in a little wacky inn in Vermont, surrounded by the wacky townspeople, uh, the, and, he, and Bob played uh, the innkeeper at the Stratford Inn, again, surrounded by all the wackiness uh, that that Vermont town could handle. Well, uh, after many seasons on CBS and decent ratings, Bob decided that Newhart should come to an end. So they did. And in the process, Bob ended up creating one of the best series finales in history. No matter the list that you read, whether it's TV Guide or Rolling Stone, the New Heart series finale is always listed in the top five. I think it's actually number two, a second only to six feet under. So a little background. Uh, in the series finale, again, spoiler alert for a 45-year-old show, but in the series finale, Bob decides to sell his inn to uh, a group of Japanese businessmen. Now, I'm going to stop here uh, with a little personal anecdote. In the clip you're getting ready to see, my uncle, uh, well, my husband's uncle, Saab, uh, is in this finale. Sabo, if you look at his IMDb, has been in every television show you can imagine. He is one of the most famous Japanese-American actors ever in the history of Hollywood. He began on Broadway with Angela Lansbury in, in, uh, in MAME. And uh, L.A. Law, Cheers, Seinfeld, Knott's Landing, Friends, you name a show, Saab has been in it. More recently, Hawaii Five-0. But again, in this episode, Saab plays one of the Japanese businessmen. He's in the group of Japanese businessmen that decide to take over the inn. Now, I am going. So let's look at let's look at Saab, and then I'm going to tell you why this ended up being one of the best finales ever. Here's a little bit of Saab. <laughs> Uh, Ohio Sunatra. Ohio gozaimasu. You know, you don't have to be so formal around here. Our last handyman didn't wear a suit and tie. Uh, Joanna, it's just Sunatra's way of, of saying he's honored to, to be working for me. Honored. Ah, 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 I laugh. <laughs> so, the group of businessmen decide to buy the end. Now, Remember when I said that Bob was in a show before this called the Bob Newhart Show? On that long-running show, also on CBS, Bob, Bob had a wife on there, played by the wonderful, the legendary Suzanne Plachette. Well, in a nod to Dallas, which I told you about a little bit ago, Bob thought it would be brilliant to do a take of It's All Been a Dream shower scene, but his version. What you're getting ready to see is the closing moments of the show. Now remember, Mary Fran is his wife in Newhart. Suzanne Plachette with the dark hair was his wife on the Bob Newhart show. So I'm gonna show you the last moments of the show and I'm gonna tell you how it all came to be. Look at this. Honey, <coughs> honey, wake up. You, you won't believe the dream I just had. Mm. <laughs> but don't you wanna hear about it? <sighs> Bob, what is it? Well, I, I was an innkeeper in this crazy little town in Vermont. 
I'm happy for you. <laughs> Good night. Unbelievable. I've read interviews from people that were there at the taping that night, and they said the, the applause when Suzanne Plachette was revealed, when Bob turns on the nightstand lamp and Suzanne rolls over, and it's her character and the set from the, from the Bob Newhart show, the studio audience went crazy. Why? Because they didn't know it was happening. Listen to this. This is one of those great stories. So they decided to quietly wheel in the bed set, the entire set. They kept it behind a curtain. The studio audience there uh, watching the taping of the finale had no idea what was behind that black curtain. They had kept that entire bedroom set completely secret, completely hidden as they loaded in the studio audience and as they taped the rest of the episode. It was in a completely different part of the studio. And then they rolled camera, they said action, and then opened up that black curtain to a set, well, in the dark. So when we see Suzanne Plachette, that's when the studio audience saw Suzanne Plachette uh, at, for the very first time, leading to that unbelievable reaction. Look, I know three camera sitcoms, that's what they call traditional sitcoms in front of a studio audience. I know they're no longer in fashion, but that right there is an example of why they can be so magical, whether it's I Love Lucy or Friends when Rachel and Ross kissed for the first time or a moment like this, the energy that the studio audience brings cannot be matched. As I said, uh, New Heart, the series finale, went down in TV history as one of the best of all time and was also a huge ratings hit for CBS. Uh, Bob and Suzanne Plachette remained friends for, for uh, many, many years. And, uh, oh, I just love that show. You can see it uh, on DVD. You can also uh, stream it, too. And to Saab... I love you very much. He's just the best. So make sure you go search on, go search Saab on IMDb, and chances are you've seen him on a show or 40. We're going to wrap things up in just a little bit. I sure hope you've enjoyed this uh, trip down memory lane. Stay right there. We'll be back right after this. Uh, I just want to take a moment, uh, as I said at the top, and now we're at the bottom, uh, I want to reiterate something that I said at the beginning. I just want to thank my grandma, Mazak, uh, who is no longer with us. My grandma didn't uh, really get to see any of this. I just want to say thank you to my grandma, Mazak, who really nurtured uh, my love of television. If it wasn't for her telling uh, my dad just to let me be, don't worry about him not going outside. Um, my grandma really didn't talk like that, but uh, telling my dad just to let me be that uh, I, I was doing this for a reason. And I think she was right. I know she was right. If it wasn't for her and my Friday nights eating Long John Silver's watching Dallas, uh, I wouldn't be here, and it was, would have changed the complete trajectory of my life. So, Grandma Mazak, I love you. Thank you for all those nights loving me, caring for me, letting me be myself, and uh, hanging with me with the Ewings. Now, uh, I want you to come see us. We're going to be coming back in just a little bit uh, with Kendall. So go to eventbrite.com and be in our studio audience. Search The Jason Show and pick a day and come see us. We're going to take a break. We're wrapping things up right after this. Welcome back to our behind-the-scenes extravaganza. You know, uh, as we uh, say goodbye to 2023, we look forward. Uh, we look forward. What am I making pizza? Uh, as we look forward uh, to the new year and the second half of season nine, I'm feeling a little bit of gratitude, and I just want to take a moment. I've thought, uh, thanked my grandma, and now I want to thank you as we come to the half point of our season nine. Thanks to all of you uh, that have discovered us in this season, all of our new friends in Madison and Iowa and Wisconsin, Chicago, Seattle, Orlando, and of course, our hometown, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Thank you for embracing our show. Thank you for sending us notes. It means a lot to our entire staff. So here is to a fantastic second half half of season nine and don't forget shameless plug if you want to show your love for our show go to our swag shop you can see uh find a link on all of our socials just search for jason show tv on facebook x or twitter or whatever they're calling it instagram tiktok myspace wherever and you can follow me personally just search for jason matheson have a great day and as i always say if you're watching and you're a kid that's being bullied you go out there and be yourself because nobody can tell you you're doing it wrong. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.